everybody. Um, so we are the mobility team and we are exploring urban tr transportation as a factor in social exclusion and what the future of urban mobility might look like for Venice. I'm Emma. I'm Tyler. I'm Raul. So um, just like the two projects that just presented before us, we are contributing to the Smart Desk project, which is EU funded. And um, the Smart Desk project is looking to identify social exclusions due to over tourism in eight different case study cities across the EU, EU including, of course, Venice. There we go. Um, and we are working with Serendipity, which is doing the Venice case study. Um, and specifically, we're looking at the speed and cost of transportation in Venice. Um, so just some background information that's uh, really vital for introducing the problem we're exploring. Um, the population of Venice has decreased by 125,000 since 1951, which was the peak of the population. And so the Smart Desk Project completed 56 interviews with residents who, migrate, who have uh, migrated out of Venice and found that the primary reason for leaving Venice was for school. And the primary reason for staying away once they left was because of work, because of the job availability. Um, however, most of these emigres would love to return to Venice one day. Um, and they cited jobs as the primary reason for what would have to change before they would decide to return to Venice. So the residents who are currently living in Venice, who did not emigrate out, um, are mostly working, or the ones who work outside of Venice in these higher paying jobs, um, a lot of the fields here are not uh, tourism related at all and they're higher paying than the tourism jobs you can find in the historic city. And most of these commuters are really not traveling very far onto the mainland for their work. Um, we'll see shortly that most of these locations are about 30 minutes from the train station in the historic city of Venice or even 10 to 15 minutes from it. Um, so anything highlighted in gray on this map, you can reach within 30 minutes from the train station um, in the historic city of Venice, Santa Lucia. And so we can see that these locations are the ones represented in the previous graph. People are really not traveling very far on the mainland because it takes so long to even get to the mainland. And so what if there was a future where we could get people to the train station faster, get people onto the mainland faster, and maybe within a one hour commute, you could reach all of these areas on the mainland. There'd be a lot more jobs available for um, commuter residents of the historic city. And so throughout this presentation, we're gonna present three parts. Um, we're going to show how Venice has adapted its transportation system over time throughout history. We're going to show that uh, even though it has adapted a lot, there are still limitations and problems today. And we're going to look at what some possibility for the future might look like. So Venice um, has evolved a lot since its founding, um, but most of the major changes that have appeared um, are kind of scrunched up towards the end. Um, but ever since its founding um, in, the, in the fifth century, it's been evolving um, as much as it can with limitations of technology. Um, so specifically in the first, for the, from around the 500 to the 19th century, um, most of the changes that have happened have just been like ground, groundwork for the future changes that will appear. Um, specific, uh, firstly, rowboats have been around since the founding of Venice, um, so much so that Cassiodorus, a monk and writer uh, under uh, the king of the Ost Ostrogoths at the time, uh, wrote in a letter speaking about how the Venetians tie up their boats like um, horses to the walls of their houses. Um, uh, so one of the most commonly seen boats in Venice is the um, gondolas. Uh, they were uh, introduced in 1093 um, because they were a, a skinnier, less long, and just more easily maneuverable boat that could be used in the canals to reduce traffic time and speed up the kind of process of moving between the city, which was becoming an issue with so many boats in the water. Um, Traghetti were also used. Um, they kind of, they're a, they were used to uh, travel from the mainland to uh, anywhere in Venice, um, really. Uh, one known stop is from Mestra all the way to Murano, which is uh, interesting um, and is kind of amazing how people could fit in that small boat for that such a long time. But the main um, Traghetti stops that we know today had, didn't really appear until the 13th century and they were used to cross the Grand Canal. 
Um, horses have also been around since the beginning, but um, they're less commonly used because there's not many places, but Venice used to have horse infrastructure. Uh, campo is, means like field in, in Italian, um, and so horses would eat in the fields and then, or like, like go to the bathroom in the fields and that's where they would keep them. And then, um, but around kind of the beginning of the 12th century, Venice became, was starting to uh, add canal walls and kind of cobblestone pathways and stone bridges. And so horses couldn't easily get in and out of the water and uh, couldn't easily walk on the cobblestone paths. So uh, they kind of began to lose their value in a way. Um, this is the, uh, the first stone bridge in Venice. It's, um, the, it's right next to the Doge's Palace. Um, the Rialto was the first dry connection over the Grand Canal, originally called uh, Ponte Moneta, which literally translates to Bridge of Money. Um, it was a, to troll, a toll bridge, sorry, um, and cost the same as using a traghetti because at the time, it was the same kind of process. If you wanted to cross the canal, you had to pay. Um, it was also a drawbridge to allow sailboats to go through the Grand Canal. Um, and then in the, 14, in the uh, 1400s, horses were banned from Venice, leaving only boats and bridges to be used. Um, so uh, the, the Rialto being one of them, um, smaller bridges as well, and then uh, the gondolas were a big part of that. Um, and so that brings us up to the fall of the uh, Venetian Republic, which happened in 19, er, 1797. Um, and then uh, Venice became uh, put under Austrian control. And 40 years, 40 years later, we get our first kind of big evolution, which is connecting Venice to the mainland um, with the train bridge in 1840. Um, that train bridge was used to speed up the process of getting goods and people to the mainland. So everything's trying to get faster, get more modernized. Um, and also with the kind of speeding up of the Venetian transportation system, you have steamboats that are um, introduced to kind of the, the city's landscape. This is the Regina Margarita, which is the uh, first steamboat to be in, uh, put into the Venetian Canal. Um, it's French made along with its sister boat. Uh, one of two, the first two were French made and then the last six of the first eight um, kind of steamboats in the canal. Um, were kind of uh, bought together. Um, and they were under a French company until uh, ACNI took over as kind of the main public transportation system, uh, making, the, making routes, making stops, making it faster and more modernized. Um, ACNI eventually led to ACNIL, uh, which eventually became the ACTV. Um, a car bridge was also built in 1933, uh, right alongside the train bridge. The car bridge goes to Pizzola Roma, as we know, and um, was constructed to allow cars to come. And this car bridge was built 60 years after the first patent of a car. So Venice, for a while, did a really good job when steam, like 40 years after, 40 years after the first train, there was a train bridge. 50 years after the first steamboat, there was a steam, there were steamboats in Venice. 60 years after the first car, cars in Venice. Venice. Venice did a really good job of keeping up with technology up until underground subways. Um, and with cars, you need parking. Um, and so the, the first uh, parking garage was also constructed in 1933. And then uh, the Rio Nuovo, which was constructed um, or was dug out to connect Pizzola uh, Roma to kind of the um, uh, tourism hub to allow better and easier access to that area and more uh, easily flow, the more, to allow the flow of traffic to flow more easily. Um, diesel boats were introduced in 1934. This is the Hippopotamo, originally known as Annabella uh, Foscari. Uh, she was one of seven boats that were introduced, um, and they were, uh, they were under the ACNI control and used on those um, fleet, uh, in, in those kind of um, like uh, routes. Um, and then in the 1960s, circular routes were added as well as uh, numbered lines. So the number one used to be called the Grand, uh, Canal Grande line, uh, but they changed it to number one around this time. And they also made circular lines, so it's evolving, it's becoming a more modernized system, and it's, it's speeding up. And so, um, as we can see, the transportation systems in Venice have a lot, evolved a lot over time, and that brings us to the system that we have today. 
of course, before you can arrive in Venice and start moving throughout the canals, you have to actually get into the city or get out of it if you're a commuter looking to work on the mainland. There are a lot of different ways you can do that. So the Ponte della Libertà brings commuters um, in and out of Venice by road and rail. Uh, and there are also ways that you can get in to or from the historic city via boat, um, especially uh, this is for people coming from the airport. So every single day, 371 trains arrive at Venezia Santa Lucia, and 378 trains depart from that station every day. And we can see where it's located here. Um, you'll notice over the next couple of slides, a lot of the transportation hubs are located in the same area right at the end of the bridge. And of course, this bridge also has cars and a road for buses and things like that, as Tyler described. So we see many different bus companies in the Venice area and in the Eastern Veneto region, um, including ACTV, which Tyler just mentioned um, and we'll hear more about soon, as well as ATVO. Uh, many of them have bus routes with Termini at Piazzale Roma, um, which is located right next to the train station here. And there's also a tram line that does end in Piazzale Roma. Um, most of these stations are on the mainland in the Mestra and Marghera area, which is where we saw earlier a lot of the commuters who live in the historic city but work on the mainland are working in Mestra and Marghera. Um, however, in 2015, they did add a stop at Venezia, uh, at Piazzale Roma, sorry, which is in that same area that we've seen the other transportation hubs. And the people mover really takes advantage of the fact that all of these transportation hubs are in the same location. Um, it's a cable car with only three stops and it moves about 300, uh, sorry, 3,200 people hourly um, and the route only takes four minutes. So it stops at Tronchetto where a lot of the parking is located, uh, the Maritime Station and Piazzale Roma. Um, and as I just mentioned, parking, of course, there is a lot of it. Um, because people can drive across the bridge and park at the historic city. So uh, there are about 8,200 parking spots available in the historic city. There's also a large garage on the other side of the bridge on the mainland, um, but of course that's less convenient if you're trying to access the historic city of Venice. So as you can see, the prices are pretty expensive. So a lot of the people who are regularly coming in and out of Venice will actually get a monthly or annual pass for their parking spot, which is a lot cheaper. And in order to get your car to Lido, which also has paved roads for cars and buses and things like that, um, you take a ferry boat, which is operated by ACTV. Uh, the most common line, line 17, starts at Tronchetto, where the parking is, and in 35 minutes, you'll arrive on Lido. And then another way that you can get to the historic city is via boat, especially from the airport, with um, the Ali Laguna boats. And so now we're gonna start talking about different types of boats. Um, so this is just an overview of the different types of boats that you'll see in the Venetian canals. Um, and first we're going to talk about ACTV and Ali Laguna. Um, so the Ali Laguna boats connect to the Marco Polo airport. And you can see that up here on this route map, they operate a total of five different lines. Um, the most common being the blue line, which makes stops all around the historic city and brings a lot of um, people from the airport. And so now we've actually gotten into the city. How are we going to move throughout it? Um, as I mentioned before, there are all these transportation hubs located in the same area of the city. But of course, as we all know, um, Venice has a very unique transportation system because of its canals. You can't just drive a car from here to here. You've got to walk or take a boat of some sort. Um, and so ACTV, which is the company that operates the water buses, as well as a lot of the other transportation options I've been discussing, such as the tram bus um, and the people mover, uh, has also adapted and evolved a lot since its inception, just like all of the other transportation systems in the city. So it was founded in 1978 and began operations in October. And then in 1998, it introduced the circular lines that we know today, um, which Tyler discussed a little bit. So these are, instead of going point to point and then going back, like back and forth, it would go all around the city and make a big loop, um, which tends to be a lot more convenient. In 1991, the Rio Novo closed to boat traffic. Um, and as a result, some of the lines are redone and the Judeca Canal is used a lot more, especially for these circular routes. In 1999, the Rio de l'Arsenal was closed. Um, We'll hear more about this later, but it was actually closed due to repairs that had to be made to the, to the canal 
walls, and it was never reopened. As a result, of course, they had to redo the lines again. So line 61 and 62, which we know today as line six that go to Lido, um, began its operations when they had to redo the lines because of this change. In the 2007 or 2008, um, line 82 was renumbered to line two. And then in 2011, they did some more renumbering of the lines. So this is just some highlights of some of the more important lines. Um, we see 61 and 62 become line six. And then in the same vein of trying to get to these important um, outer islands faster, we see Diretto Morano renumbered to three, and that's just a faster route to uh, Murano. And then eight separates from two, and two, of course, is the faster way to get down the Grand Canal. Um, and so this is the full route map of ACTV. So we can see that it does a pretty good job of connecting a lot of the major um, points in the historic city. They operate 26 water bus lines using 160 boats that park out 150 floating pontoons. And on line one, which goes down the Cran Canal, uh, it can carry over 1,000 passengers every hour. The um, ACTV operates a couple of different types of boats as water buses. There are two that are used most commonly that I'm sure we've all used before. Um, the first is the Vaporetto, which is used on lines one, two, seven, 13 and the night lines, and those can carry over 200 passengers at once. It'd be pretty crypt, but it's possible. And then the motoscafi are used on some of these more circular lines, and they're used on the lines where the boat has to cross underneath a shorter bridge. So you can visually see that the motoscafo is shorter than the vaporetto. And so these boats can only carry 150 passengers. Private water taxis are another type of boat that you'll see a lot in the historic city of Venice. And these are point-to-point -point transportation, so instead of running regular routes that are um, scheduled, they just operate uh, just like any taxi in any other city when somebody wants to travel from wherever they are to wherever they want to go. And they have to be licensed. There are currently 250 licensed taxis in the city. And I'll pass it up to Raul now. As the demand of the tourism and the need for the resident, cargo um, accounts for the 36% of cargo um, traffic. As uh, you can see, there are two types of um, cargo. There is the Conto Proprio and Conto Terzi. Conto Proprio are the ones who deliver their own products, and Conto Terzi are delivering to all the city. But how the city of Venice get these products? They get, from, they, they get it from the trucks, and the trucks going to, to the Ponte de la Libertad, to the Venice, in which are unloaded to different type of cargo, which are the refrigerator cargo, the dry cargo, and the construction truck cargo, which they are um, delivering throughout the city, and over 32,000 packages every day they are delivering. The total distance will be 3,000 kilometers. In the 2000, 2001, a group of students from the WPI suggests a different method to deliver cargo by location instead of by product. This will reduce um, a lot of traffic and also reduce motor also. So we just kind of briefly mentioned Motondozo, but we do need to unpack what that actually is a little bit, um, as well as some of the other problems with the current transportation system of Venice. Um, one of the pretty obvious problems if you use the Vaporetti for long enough is that there are way too many boats in the canals. Um, this is a very wide, this is the Judeca Canal, so it's extremely wide, but you can even see um, right in this area, there's a bunch of boats piling up, and there were some even behind that you can't really see. Um, it's quite common that you'll be waiting at a boat stop and your boat can't actually pull up because another one hasn't been able to leave yet. Um, and there have even been instances of boats crashing into other boats and this has caused some tragic accidents including injuries and deaths. Um, and then there are a couple of weather limitations that just like in a city, for example, it just snowed in Worcester, and so people are having a hard time driving. In a similar vein, um, the fog and other weather conditions can limit the operations of boats. If you can't see where you're going, it's incredibly dangerous to be navigating a boat, and so a lot of the times, um, ACTV routes will be canceled completely or only run in certain areas, um, and private taxis and other privately operated boats may not run at all. And similarly, aqua alta or high tides limit the ability of boats to operate. They can safely operate as long as they have enough visibility, but they may not be able to cross under lower bridges. So we see this guy having to crouch down to actually make it under this bridge. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the circular routes cut into linear segments or people having to reroute um, their boat in order to not cross under these lower bridges. 
Moton dozo, we've kind of briefly mentioned it, but it actually refers to wake motion that is produced from boats. Um, so it's this kind of energy that's coming from the motor um, spinning underwater. And it can be, it sounds kind of mundane, but it's actually really um, harmful to the canal walls, which are expensive to fix. It can cost up to $11,000 um, to fix a single square meter of canal wall. And it can also lead to um, buildings crumbling, which is, of course, very dangerous and costly. Um, so one way that Motondozo can be mitigated is by introducing speed limits. So the city has been introducing, um, or sorry, did introduce speed limits a long time ago. They haven't really changed since then. And so this is a map where you can see um, that throughout every single canal in Venice, there is a speed limit. However, only about 3% of boats are following the speed limits. Um, and we know this because of the boat count surveys that the 35th team mentioned earlier. So the lined transportation, the ACTV boats, are following the speed limits because they have a schedule to stick to, but private water taxis and cargo boats are rarely, if ever, following them. Um, additionally, because the lined transportation has to follow these speed limits, the uh, like commute times are a lot slower because you have a limit to how fast you can move. And so um, what can we do about all these problems? <laughs> there's, there's a lot we, we could do, but one um, possibility is a sublaganare, which is a subway under the lagoon. Um, and this has been explored throughout history. There are a lot of previous proposals that people have thought of. So in 1911, an engineer named Daniel Dongi um, proposed this very interesting proposal. There's a lot to it, including bridges, trams, and some underwater passages. Um, the one that's most interesting for us is right here between um, uh, San Zaccaria and Lido Quattro, Quattro Fontane, and it would be an underwater passage um, with a pedestrian tunnel in the middle and then two electric trams on either side. So basically, a subway system. This never happened, of course. We don't have a subway system today. Um, in 1933, we see another proposal for a sublagonare. It would be one single line um, all the way from Mestre through the historic city, and then down Lido to Kyoja. So quite a long route, of course, this also never happened. Um, in 1959, this one's a little different. Um, they thought, okay, we have cars now. Why don't we bring cars into the historic city of Venice? So they wanted to build a highway uh, down the bridge, and then an underground highway for cars to drive through. Um, that would have all gone down Fondo Metenove and all the way to Punta Sabioni. But of course, we do not have this today. In 1990, um, so getting to pretty recent history now, uh, there's a proposal to create a people mover, was the name of it, but it would have been two lines of tram, and at one point um, in the historic city in this area, it would have gone underground and become a sublagonare. Um, there are three stops here that are at the transportation hubs. And a lot of the stops on the mainland are where we see people commuting to today. So it really followed the kind of population center patterns that we know of. And of course, did not happen in real. Uh, in 2005, yet another proposal that did not happen yet. Um, there was a proposal from the mayor of Venice to implement a sublogonare. And again, it would have focused on the historic city being connected to areas of the mainland. And this time, it was actually the airport area and Tessera. Um, there were also a couple of stops in Murano, and of course, this was not implemented. We do not have a subway system today. In 2017, a, another group of WPI student researchers expanded on this 2005 proposal, and they created their own um, subway proposal that was an extension of the one from 2005. And in 2022, maybe, maybe someday this one will happen, we have another proposal. As you can see in this map, we have all the proposals for the, um, sub, the sub, sub Lagunare. As you can see, the main purpose for the Sub Lagunare is reducing time and making opportunities for the residents to travel to the historical city much faster and also connecting to the other side of Italy. So this, you can see from 1911 to 2005 proposal have been done. And you can see the different color representing the, 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 the lines that should be um, for the Sub Lagunare and the 2017 for for the um, IQP project. So for this year, 
So a faster way to in and out to city of Venice. We have come up with the, uh, the new proposal, which include connecting to the airport, to the mainland, and also to the historical city, Lido, Murano, and potentially to Chioga. So we're going to break it up, um, this um, route, this process, into three phases. These phases is going to have uh, three tunnels, underwater tunnels. We have two for rail tracks and one for maintenance. The first phase we're going to start with uh, Ferro Ferrovia Pizza de Roma. This will be the first station that will also be uh, on the, we will also have a pedestrian underwater tunnel that will connect to Troncetto, will connect to uh, Ferrovia and Pizza de Roma. This will connect people and then they connect efficiency in time. As you can see here, they have like the design of the station or how it's gonna look like. The second station will be Palanca to uh, Satire. This also will have an underwater pedestrian and you can see a design for the underwater pedestrian. You will have a, a tunnel that will connect the both Palanca and Sestier, so people can, can go to the station and walk and cross the canal much faster instead of taking a boat or train. So this will eliminate congestion transportation and also alleviate the time to cross. And the, se the, third, the third station will have San Marco and Judeca. And the, the, the fourth station will be Santa Elena and Lido. So we're going to compare the time between the current system and the future system for the new Subo Lagunare. As you can see, we take an example from uh, a resident from Lido who commute every time to Ferrovia. As you can see here, just in the station, it takes around 36 minutes to go to Ferrovia. For our new proposal, we want to get to the Ferrovia a much faster time that will be 12 minutes. It will reduce the number of time to uh, stay in the boat. It will reduce the time of commuting people because it's going to be more faster and they can reach amount of time in other places. The second phase will also connect from uh, Santa Elena Lido to the airport. This will be um, a connection that will benefit for the north side of, of the city. So this, the fifth location will be in Hospedale Fundamento Nove. This is one of the key components because it's close to the hospital and, and, and it's easy to reach in faster time with the new system. The sixth location will be Murano, and the seventh location will be Marco Polo Airport. So comparing the time between the second phase, it will take, for the current time, it will take one hour and six minutes. And for the new proposal, it only will take 70 minutes. So 70 minutes to take from Santa Elena Lido to the airport. But also, our group uh, pro, um, proposed as well a connection between um, Ferrovia to Hospedale. In, in that way, the resident can travel around the historical city instead of going to the airport. So we mean it will cut time for the people who want to go just in the historical city and also for the people who want to go to Murano or the airport. So the time to do this, the whole loop for the historical city, it only would take 23 minutes. So in 23 minutes, you can do a, a round the route from Ferrovia, pass it to um, Judeca, to San Marco, Lido, Hospedale, and come back to Ferrovia. As you can see here on the visuals, we have the time in which they can see how much is the time difference between the stations. And also for the phase three, we also want to connect to the Marco Airport to um, San Giuliano. This station is one of the most important part because on San Giuliano has a parking in which the residents in which all, and tourists and which the commuters can leave the park there and take the train. We also alleviate congestion for the bridge and also congestion for the parking spot because some of, some of the time the parking spot is, fu is full of limit and they have a lot of congestion in the, in the bridge. So we want to eliminate congestion transportation by creating this stop and make the people park there as well. So for the commuting time from San Guignano to Pizza Roma, it will take around 32 minutes. And for the fastest time, it will take, for the new Sub Lagunar proposal, it will take just six minutes from San Guignano to um, Ferrovia. And so San Giuliano to airport, it also takes six minutes. So, oh, okay, there we go. Uh, and so just to connect this to the commute problem that we were talking about earlier, 
um, we can see that within 15 minutes of Feravia, you can really only reach a couple of areas on the mainland, and it's really the Mestre Marghera area that we currently see people commuting to who live in the historic city of Venice. And that's because it can take people up to 45 minutes or even maybe longer from some areas in southern Lido to even get to the train station. So unless you want your commute to be more than an hour, you're not going to commute very far onto the mainland. Um, some Venetians live closer to the train station, and so they might commute to our areas such as Padova or Treviso that are 30 minutes away. Um, so everything highlighted on this map you can reach within 30 minutes of the train station. And then if we could get commuters to the Ferrovia or Piazzale Roma area faster, um, say in 15 minutes or less, as with Raul's proposal, then within a one-hour commute they have 45 more minutes to actually move on the mainland. And so within 45 minutes from um, Santa Lucia, you can reach any of these areas. So we see whole new cities popping up on this map, such as Vicenza, most of Padova, um, and Treviso, and even cities north of Treviso. And some people, of course, are okay with a little bit of a longer commute than one hour, maybe an hour and a half. And so we just wanted to show that within one hour from Santa Lucia or Ferrovia, you can actually reach all of the areas highlighted on this map. So if we can get commuters to the mainland even faster, they'll be able to reach way more job opportunities and have better economic growth. So how are we gonna build this underwater? Uh, so wait. So first we're gonna take uh, consideration on the immersed tube tunnel construction method that will be cheaper and also will be efficient for the city. And also this uh, method is already being done with Moses. As you can see here is that the construction of Moses, they ha Moses has two pedestrian tunnels in which um, the residents from Lido in this side of the map can travel just crossing using the Moses. So we use this Moses to take in consideration for our proposals to build the immersed tunnel. So, to build the immersed tunnel. Also, we take in consideration the train system, which we're gonna take the driverless train system that is gonna be a new, de new design because it's not gonna be have driver. So this, this is gonna go around the loop to the historical city and connecting to the other part of the stations. And the total cost will be 7.5 billion. We're gonna do it in three phases. So the first phase will cost two billion. The second phase, because it's the more longer um, travel time, it, more longer travel, it will take four billion. And the phase three will take 1.5 billion. So the total cost will be 7.5 billion. In a potential uh, future phase, it will connect to Santa Elena Lido to Kyoya. This will, this will provide more efficient, more uh, opportunity for the people who live in and Chioja to get to the um, Venezia, the, to the historical city in much faster. And the time to take for Chioja to Santa, Santa, Elena, um, Santa Elena and Lido, it would take only 15 minutes. So the benefit to having a sub lagunare is we're gonna reduce the job, we're gonna expand the job market for Venetian, we're reducing motodons, so we're reducing congestion in canals and ability to work in any weather condition 24 hours in seven days. So like the two groups I just presented before us, we've created a repository with a lot of information on the history of the Venetian transportation system, the current state of it in 2022, and what a Suglaganare might be able to do for Venice in the future. So thank you so much. Um, this is a link to our team website and how you can contact us, and if there are any questions, we'd be happy to take them.